attending today. What we'll do today is we'll take on the topic of clustering and as Avi said, advanced clustering because we go beyond the regular k-means clustering. But in doing that, I feel like we should start with it and we should demonstrate it to motivate another type of clustering method. Now, uh, in a way I should apologize because while we'll cover DB scan density-based clustering, a variant of that, which is very powerful and flexible, there's a lot more we could discuss. In our regular courses, we get into things like spectral clustering, which is very, very powerful and allows you to be able to incorporate some type of secondary information about relationships between samples in your data set. It can be very, very powerful. But today we'll focus on density-based, which I think people will find interesting. Let's start with some introductions. I promise these are, and people who've done these webinars before, I really apologize to you because you probably heard me do this too many times, so I'll be really quick about it. But just a little bit of introduction about myself. I'm Michael Perch. If you've never met me before and you've just read my name, I apologize. It is really hard. It looks hard to pronounce, but just say it like Perch and you'll do it as well as my family does. And that's what we've, that's what we've been saying for a hundred years in Canada. It's my understanding that when I meet Ukrainians that, or Polish people that we actually don't pronounce it correctly. We kind of turn it into Canadian pronunciation. I imagine I'm from industry. I have about um, 13 years of experience working in Chevron's research um, energy technology company. I believe it was just renamed, but I have lots of experience in teaching, consulting, training, um, looking at reservoir modeling projects all over the world. And so I very much enjoyed my time in industry. I've only been a professor here for just the three years or so. I'm also very flexible. Um, when we do courses together, if there's something that's not working, if there's feedback, if you need to spend a little bit more time to understand something, I'm very much a fan of being learnings driven rather than schedule driven. Spend the time we need to so we can bring everyone along. I also am available. People do contact me. There was a VP from one of the medium sized energy companies told me recently, they said, I like you, Michael. You're one of my favorite professors. When I call you, you pick up the phone. And I, I do, I try to be responsive to people in the industry, working professionals and so forth. I try, I try, it's a lot sometimes. I'm an engineer and a geoscientist. I do, I am du duly appointed in the Cockrell School of Engineering and the Jackson School of, Jackson School of Geosciences. And so if we're covering a topic and I speak too much like an engineer for you, let me know when I can switch back to my geoscience way of explaining and we can kind of we can make sure we go at it from both directions to help you understand uh, both angles of attack on that. Um, I have written a lot of papers and done a lot of work in this in statistical modeling, data analytics, geostatistics. I would say even long before it was cool. I know there's a bit of a wave right now, but I've been working in this area for a while now. Um, but like a lot of other people learning new things like deep learning, I just put together an auto encoder lecture that I'll be sharing shortly. And so I will, um, we're all learning and growing together in this field for sure. Now, Avi, I noticed there is an issue with connectivity issue if you want to help out there. I'm sure you saw that. Appreciate that. Okay. The other thing is, um, if anyone hasn't seen this, I do put out a lot of content on Twitter, GitHub, a lot of well-documented workflows, Geostat Guy lectures um, on YouTube. A lot of working professionals actually go in and get a lot of content from there. I am committed to supporting and partnering with the development opportunities for working professionals and even potential students. That's why I do that. I share a lot of my university lectures. Okay, what's the goals? Let me, I'll tell you what, since I spent so much, oh, well, maybe three minutes, four minutes talking about myself, let me go ahead and ask you about yourselves. Is everybody able to see the poll? Can you guys all see that? Or you can, people are answering it, perfect. What is your expertise? Do we have geoscientists, engineers, people from business and finance? We did, actually, Avi, we did that one time, 200 people from HR. Was yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Yeah. We did that one time, a basic introduction, machine learning, very cool. Human resources, data science, or other. I have 38 responses, I'll close it in three, two, one, end polling. Okay, let's share the results. Okay, wow, look at that, okay, so, this is pretty typical, I think. A little bit more geoscientists than engineers, but then we have the remainder about 25%. Now I'll be interested, if you are one of the four data scientists, 
um, go ahead and just let us know in the chat window, like what area did you come from? Did you actually go directly into data science? That's very cool. Um, we've encountered people who come from a diverse backgrounds of science, engineering, and so forth, got into data science. We've run into a lot of geoscientists who do data science and so forth. L let us know. We'd be interested to hear what your background was. And then other, let us know in the chat window what other is. That's very interesting to us, of course. Okay. Stop sharing the results. Let's go ahead and go to just a couple more questions. Now, this is the big one. This is the big question. It is, do you code? Do you code? Now, when we do examples and demonstrations, we're gonna be using Python code here. And so don't worry, there won't be a test. We'll walk through, when we teach, we teach coding, we teach workflow construction, but at the same time, we, um, in my courses, we go at it from the angle of how do you use the tools, not the in-depth, how do you build the coding capabilities. Now, Dr. Foster works with me in data. He does a lot more of the data science, the how do you best work with NumPy and object-oriented and, and Dask and all of that stuff. Okay, do you code? Let me go ahead. I'll end the polling in three, two, one, and share the results. Okay, we have 36% every day they code to get the job done, to get their job done. Amazing, that's very cool. Hey, jump in. If you see something in one of my workflows I could improve, I do welcome feedback and you'll get credit. We'll, we'll put you as a co-author, help out on something. That's very cool. I code sometimes to solve unique problems and automate my work. Automation is very, very powerful, very powerful. Um, I've learned some coding would like to do more. That's, that's a large number too. I do not code. You know, if this was a regular course, those two people, we would spend some time maybe encouraging you, showing you some of the advantages, having some basic coding capabilities. I, I think that we could help. At the same time, um, the great thing is there's a lot of early learnings that can happen very fast. We've seen people with very little coding background who can just get the job done. So we can motivate and help you with that. Okay, let's stop sharing the result. Just a couple more questions and we'll be into content. Now, I'm interested in this too, because if you ask me, data analytics is statistics. I don't know if anybody wants to argue that or suggest otherwise, I'd be interested to discuss. But do you use statistics in your job? I frequently use statistics. I sometimes use statistics at work. I do not use statistics. All right, so we've got 41 responses so far. I'll close the poll in three, two, one. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everybody, for responding to this. We do appreciate it. This is helpful for all of us to kind of see a snapshot of those interested in participating. I frequently use statistics. Interesting. I wish I could ask some follow-up questions. To what degree? Bayesian or frequent with, frequent to statistics? You know, are you doing confidence intervals on everything you do? Are you doing analysis of variance? Is it more kind of a Bayesian and machine learning context? What's going on? That'd be very interesting. I sometimes use statistics at work, 44% and uh, one person who does not use statistics. We could spend a little bit of time and teach you a couple of statistical tools to get you started. Okay, one more question right here. This is a good one because this will help us during our short time together. What are your expectations today? General concepts, terminology, limitations. That's the overview. That's the manager, the decision maker. Examples and ideas of what can be done it can be very useful. Adopt some of this at work. You want to see something that after this hour, I mean at two o'clock central time, you can walk away and start trying it out. Adopt some of this at work, or I'm an expert, I'm trying to fill in some gaps. We've had that before. Great experts who attend with us to learn how to communicate with people learning, which is powerful. That's important. Okay, I'll end the poll in three two, one, and show the res results. Okay, what do we have here? We have about 20% general concepts, terminology, limitations, kind of that manager overview, be able to support decision-making with this technology. Examples and ideas of what can be done. This is very useful too. Now, I imagine there's some overlap. There's probably some people who were kind of torn between those two categories. I imagine that. Adopt some of this at work. You want to just start doing it. And I'm an expert. We have three people here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to expect there may be some tough questions today as we get into the content. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate that. I think we have a better idea of who we're um, working with today. Let's talk about clustering for inference. 
we're going to introduce the concept of clustering as a powerful form of inferential machine learning. Inference, in our regular course, we spend time talking about predictive versus inferential approaches in machine learning. Let me just summarize it. It's discovering patterns in complicated high dimensionality data sets. Now, I say that, but then I show all of my examples with two features, feature one, feature two, and I show our clustering results, our grouping within the data, trying to find natural groups within the data. Structure, that's an important part of structure. And I'll do it in two features all the time. That's for the purpose of rapid and easy visualization. Now, if at any point in this discussion, you sit back and you go, come on, Perch, I could have just figured that out. I could have drew the line and separate the data into two or three groups. Remember, high dimensionality, complicated. In that case, you would not be able to. Has anybody here ever tried looking through 10, 20 dimensional data? Very, very difficult. And I'll, I'll tell you, even if you try to look at any of the subsets of possible projections, you are only seeing a fraction. The curse of dimensionality is vast. You're only seeing a very small part of the data structure. Okay, so we'll talk about how we can use machine learning methods. Inferential, we're trying to learn about the the data structures. We're not trying to make predictions at this step. Let's just mention what prototypes are. We talk about prototypes because they are central to the k-means clustering approach. So a prototype is really this. Let's go back to our, what I'll call the feature space. Features are just the variables for the machine learning folks. It sounds cool. If you're old school statistics, you're welcome to call them variables. And you might think of them as the independent variables in this case, because we're not making predictions. In this case, we have feature one, feature two, and the feature space is going to be the total combination of possible things that can happen between those two features. Maybe it can't go here. Maybe this is something that's non-physical. Maybe this is also. Maybe this shape is intrinsic to the problem. Now you're starting to talk about the feature space and its structure. So we're going to show you a bunch of images of feature space. The prototypes are going to exist in this feature space. Here's a prototype, the red prototype. Here's the yellow prototype. They're typically not actual samples. The circles are actual data samples that you've collected. The prototypes, in fact, are going to be representative of the data samples within their group. In other words, the red star is representative of the red group and the yellow star is representative of the yellow group and they are not actual samples. Their locations are arbitrary within the combination of the features, porosity, permeability. This would be whatever porosity that is and whatever permeability that is, that's the prototype location right there. But the data are typically assigned to the nearest using Euclidean distance that's your regular type of distance where you do the square root of the square of the difference in each one of the coordinates. You can extend that to any dimension. That's Euclidean distance in any dimension. You can go ahead and you'll assign the data to the nearest prototype. That's the general idea of prototypes that we're going to be using for k-means clustering. Okay, now that we understand prototypes, let's go ahead and talk about k-means clustering. Let's explain some of the details of it. We want to assign clusters, or I could also say it's synonymous with groups, to all of the data in the feature space. Okay, so for feature one, feature two, this is the cross plot. It's a two-dimensional problem, very simple. I want to assign all of the data to group one, group two, or any number of groups, such that the groups are exhaustive. What does exhaustive mean? If you look at this notation right here, it just means the probability of the union of all the data assigned to cluster or group one through K is equal to 100%. That's exhaustive. It means all of the data must belong to a group. There's no outliers. There's nothing that gets left behind. Spoiler alert, when we get into density-based methods, we'll start leaving some stuff behind and work with outliers. The groups are mutually exclusive. That means the probability of an intersection, any one of the samples belonging to more than one group is equal to zero. In other words, you have to belong to a group and only one group can you belong to. Now I drew this line right here, but I want to be careful. I could mislead. This line, I'm just being lazy. I'm trying to explain that this is group one points, these are group two points, but let's not be confused. 
this model clustering does not discover this line. This model only labels the data, okay, into two separate groups. If we were to draw that line with our method, discover the line, that would be a predictive model because we'd be able to make predictions at locations we didn't sample. Inferential learning with clustering does not do that. Okay, so we're going to segment the data into the data into two or whatever number of groups. Now, how are we going to do that? Every time we do machine learning, there's, you know, usually, I should be careful, usually there'll be a loss function and we'll try to minimize it. In the case of k-means clustering, our loss function is known as inertia, w. And this is one thing I credit the machine learning people for. They're very good at borrowing cool sounding terminology, inertia, epochs, they, they do it really well. Momentum, well, that's optimization, but they do. They use very cool terminology. Here's another case of it, W for inertia. What this is, if you look at the equation, it's not as bad as it seems. This shorthand right here is simply the Euclidean distance between two samples, I and J within the data set. Now this double sum right here is just us comparing all of the pairwise dissimilarities, Euclidean distance, between all of the samples within a specific cluster. And this summation right here is just, we're summing over all the clusters. So what is this? This is a degree of dissimilarity within all of the clusters, all the data with each other within the clusters. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. That's our inertia calculation right there. We're gonna minimize that. Now to anyone here who, you know, doesn't necessarily have a math background or learns through visual learning, let me draw you a picture. What are we minimizing with inertia? This is it right here. We have all of our data. We've assigned arbitrarily. We just assigned group one and group two. Now what we're doing is we're calculating all of the pairwise dissimilarities or Euclidean distances. It, the way to think about it in this two-dimensional example is literally the length of these segments. Now, to those who are kind of, you know, very observant, you'll notice I was lazy with this plot because what I should have shown was the line segments between this data point and all other data within the cluster. I didn't show that because that would be a dog's breakfast. That'd be very hard to look at. But that's what I'm trying to represent right here. All of the dissimilarity by Euclidean distance between all of these are minimized. Now, what's very interesting is that effort of minimizing the dissimilarity within the groups will actually maximize the dissimilarity between the groups. When you, If you think about that, it makes logical sense, and that's a good thing to do. Okay, so that's how we're going to try to group things. Now, how do we do this? I gave you the loss function, but I didn't tell you how we're actually going to solve it in an efficient, practical manner. It's a large solution space. If you think about it, if we, even if we go back here, imagine all of the possible combinations. I could take this data, move it to group two. I could take this data, move it to group one. I could take this data, move it to group one. I could explore that full combinatorial of group one, group two. Now imagine if I had 10 groups or 20 groups or something like that. There's many combinations of possible inertias I would have to calculate and try to minimize. How do we do it? Well, it turns out we can solve it iteratively. There's a practical solution. In fact, it's known as a heuristic solution. We're going to compromise um, accuracy and rigor for speed and get a nice practical solution that really does work most of the time. It works well. The other thing is when we do that, we may converge on a local minimum. Now, this is kind of cool. A thing that we often do to, to avoid local minima when we do optimization is we'll just do multiple random starts. And then what you can do is you can look at the multiple random starts and see which one converged to the best solution that will assume is the global uh, minimum. Okay, and so that's the practical solution. And you'll see, it. we'll test it. I'll show you, it actually works pretty well with our algorithm. Okay, let's step back. Let's summarize k-means clustering. Clustering, the data in the feature space, we're working with them to identify similar cases, subsets, the structures or grouping, natural grouping. Some people call it auto group assignment is one way to also call clustering. So unsupervised learning, the training data I'll show you, they don't have, they don't start with labels. We go in and we figure out what those labels are gonna be. Inference, 
We're really working with all inputs. We don't have an output. We're not making a prediction. I hope you can see there that there's no EUR uh, recovery factor or something like that. I'm just working with a petrophysical geophysical parameter uh, feature and I'm trying to figure out relationships. Prototype method, once again, the prototype idea, iterative solution. Okay, now we're gonna need to use normalization. I will spend time and show this to you because the fact that we're calculating distances, we could also consider feature weighting though. When we get into normalization, I'll bring this up again. And there is a super supervised variant of this for classification that I'll mention too. Okay, this is, this is clustering right here. We got our porosity, we got our acoustic impedance. Notice that all of the data, the samples are gray. Nobody has a label. They're all just data. It's inferential. There's no output. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do Euclidean distance calculations. Now let's take a look and see what's going on here. This is the Euclidean distance calculation right here. We take the square of the difference in porosity, the square of the difference in acoustic impedance. We sum them, take the square root. That's Euclidean distance with two features. Now, if you look at the units, 1,500 to about 6,500 for acoustic impedance with its unit shown here. I apologize, that should be 10 to the third. Ah, I, I forgot to change that. Porosity fraction, look at that. You see what's going on here? If we drew this figure to scale, what would it look like? Could you imagine if I drew that to scale? Would you be able to read it? If you drew this to scale, it would just collapse into a line. You wouldn't see anything. All the points would just fall on a line because this distance right here is simply 0.26. And this distance right here is literally on the order of about 5,000 <laughs> units. So we can see this becomes a problem. When we have dissimilar units, we really do require normalization. So we have a similar magnitude or range for each. Otherwise, we'd have a very strong bias. I'll show you what happens if you don't do this. If we do min-max normalization in machine learning, we're just forcing the min to be a value like zero, the max to be one. Now, if you go back and forth, you see the difference? The actual data structure didn't change. We just rescaled both of them. So they have equal units. Now, if I took a vector and rotated it, it would be the same distance for every rotation. That makes more sense. That would be more logical. And we got to be careful. If we're working with same units and the differences and ranges are meaningful, we would not want to do this type of normalization or standardization. Now, what we do is we start out, I mentioned this as a heuristic approach. The way it goes is this. We're going to first seed a random prototypes, blue, red, green. Color or label is arbitrary. You could swap them. It doesn't matter. Now, what you do is you're going to take those prototypes and we'll start with those. Now, how does everyone feel about the blue prototype? Is that a good prototype or red or green? Do they look useful? No, not at all. They're not, they're not really good prototypes. It doesn't matter. We'll just seed random prototypes. We make a choice with k-means clustering. k is equal to three. Now we seed three prototypes. Now let me show you everything in the orig original units, and I'll show you in the normalized units. So you can see we're doing everything in the normalized units, but we're assigning labels to the data so we can just look at it in the original units at the same time. Okay, so there's no back transformation required. We're only getting these labels. So we go ahead. The first thing we'll do is we'll assign the data to the nearest prototype. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at it and we're going to ask a question. How do my prototypes look? Is this representative of the red? Is this representative of the green? Is this representative of the blue? Does it look okay? What do you think? It looks awful. Like this gets like a D minus or something. It just looks really, really bad. And so what we'll do is we can fix it. We'll shift the prototypes to the centroids of the assigned data samples. Okay, now we've done that. What we can do is we can look at the data assigned to those prototypes and we'll say, well, that's not right. This data should be assigned to the blue prototype. And so we make an update on the assignments. When we do that, look what happens. And so when these ones go to red, these ones go to blue, things move to the right prototype, we reassign the data. Now, if you think about it, now once again, the prototypes are not in the right location. So that's the iteration. 
shift the prototypes to the centroid of the data, reassign the data to the closest prototype, shift the data, shift the prototypes to the near to the centroid of the data, repeat, repeat, repeat. And if we do that enough times, what will happen is we'll converge. This is the heuristic approach of k-means clustering. This is how that high dimensionality problem is solved. It's a high combinatorial for sure, but it's solved practically like this. Now, theoretically, there should be a global minimum. There is the chance we get stuck in a local minimum, but we just reseed random prototypes, try again. And usually under the hood, that happens like 10 times, maybe a hundred times, it's fast. And we can go ahead and get the, the practical, it should be, we'll assume to be the global solution. Okay, so that's the overall method. We can show the cases for which we have two, seven, and so forth. Now, I want to show you some code because this is nice. I think it's really good to show some simple code. We've developed the functions to be able to do this. We have the whole thing so it's iterating and we can observe it. So what we'll do is we'll do k-means clustering. I, in all of our well-documented workflows, I like to include descriptions about the workflow, talk about them, uh, questions about the lectures and the code. Are they available later? Talk to Avi, he can help you get access to the learning management system and then you'll have access to all of the code. There's a lot of worked out demonstrations and code available there. Okay, so let's go ahead to anyone here. Let me see, by show of hands, is there anyone here who works with Jupyter Notebooks? Does stuff in Python. Okay, let me look here. This is exciting, I like this. Okay, Thomas, Thomas, um, Bryce. I see a lot of people, Brett, Eric, Min. Okay, good, good. Wow, 21, okay, so that's a lot. I'm going to assume, and thank you very much for the people in the chat window. Colab too, I get that, it's very nice. I gotta admit, I actually set up my GPU to run in TensorFlow just uh, yesterday, no, night before last. It was so much pain. It would have been nice just to do it on Colab and have it all set up or ready to work in the environment, right? Okay, thank you very much for everyone's responses. I'm gonna assume that a significant proportion of the people who didn't say yes are no. And then that'll tell me that I should explain a couple of things. This is a Jupyter Notebook. The great thing about Jupyter Notebooks is that they're a wonderful platform for prototyping. You can see right here, I'm working with Python 3. You could load and work with a variety of different programming languages. I have the R kernel. I have, there's other kernels you can work with. People work with a variety of different languages in Jupyter Notebook, like Julia or anything like that. What you do then is that you can build a pro nice prototype workflow where you work with blocks. This is a markdown block which means that I can put all kinds of nice formatting, equations, hyperlinks, and so forth. If I run it, I get the nice formatted. So you can build a really nice workflow of documentation. Then you can have a block of code with a block of code and you'll have the code and then output, demo, documentation, code, output, documentation. I like to do it like that so people can walk through your workflow. The whole thing can be hosted locally or online. And so anyone in the world can work with your workflow. I think about the many people I met who were deploying methodologies through Excel. They would do something Excel, share their sheet. I think this is a much cleaner way to use really powerful coding methodologies. If you're working with Anaconda, many of the world's most powerful packages are available to you. You can just get started. Okay, that's enough about that. Let's go ahead, we'll load a couple of packages. To people who work with Python, how's the font size? Can everybody see this all right? Can you all see my code or do you need it a little bigger? Let me know in the chat window if you need it resized. People who work with Python, as I was saying, are used to NumPy. Okay, zoom a little bit. How's that? Let me know if that helped. Um, NumPy for working with arrays and gridded data. Good, Mohammed. thanks for letting me know. Pandas um, for working with data frames. OS for being able to interact with the operating system. And Matplotlib. PyPlot for doing a lot of powerful plotting. If people produce in plotting as part of their job or for um, peer review publications, I really recommend doing it with that plot library. And there's a lot of other packages, of course, but you could get whatever resolution you need. You can make very custom plots, very cool stuff. Okay, what we'll do is we'll declare a couple of functions. In this case, we're gonna do this by hand. This function taken from a blog, modified from a blog by Ben Keen. Thank you very much, Ben. It will assign the data to the nearest centroid 
and this will update the centroid locations. You see that? So these two functions do the two steps that we're going to have in our heuristic solution. We run that code. Now we have those two functions. We'll go ahead and load up some data. We often use like the cloud and we use intake to do our data engineering. I'm running locally today, so I'm just using my hard drive. Let's go ahead and load up some data. We'll take a subset of the data so we have something fast to run and take a look at. Let's, let's look at some summary statistics. I've got facies, porosity, permeability, acoustic impedance, 144 samples. Here's the quartiles, min and max, standard deviation and means. Very, very easy to do statistical analysis in Python. Let's go ahead and set up our min max and do our min max normalization to get everything zero and one. And then we can check. It's always good. Every time I do anything with the data, I take a look, see what I did to it. Here we go. Normalized porosity, minimum zero, maximum one. Success. That's what we wanted to do. Check it and make sure there wasn't a blunder. There's always a chance. I also like to strip the data down just to the features I need. Because how many times have you done a workflow and you use the wrong column? That happens all the time in Excel for sure. And it can happen in your code. So what I do is I make a nice little data frame, which is a subset, a slice of the original data frame with the original and the normalized, normal, min-max normalized features. So I can just work with that and not get confused. Anything you can do to simplify your life. Let's go ahead, we'll set a number of K. We'll start with five, just try that out. I've got a color map here. I've got min-max for plotting and we can visualize our training data. Here's the, here's the data we're working with. No surprises, same example from the course content. We can go ahead, initialize our prototypes, teal, red, blue, green, purple. You see that? What's our next step? Assign the data to the nearest prototype. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run this code. This is our assignment. If you look at this, the code for the iteration was simply that line there with our function. All of this is just plotting. Can you imagine? Very, very compact and simple code to work with. Beautiful plots. Okay, data has been assigned to the nearest prototype. Well, next thing we've got to do, update the prototypes. That's no good. That's a terrible prototype. We've got to move it to the centroid of its data. Okay, so we do that. We drew a little lines here. We can see exactly where it moved. And now we iterate. Iterate, iterate, iterate. We keep on iterating and we're able to move to move our prototypes, reassign the data. And if we do that enough times, that's what this does right here, is we loop until the centroids, which are the prototypes, until they converge, they stop moving around. And that's what we get at the very end. Okay, so this was K means clustering by hand. Uh, you'll see next, you can do it just with one line of code. We don't need to do it by hand, but I thought that was a nice way to explain it. Okay, now I wanna make sure we have time for density base because if we didn't go further, you'd be very disappointed by this session, right? Because we said advanced clustering and all we talked about was K-means. First advanced concept, K-means clustering for classification. What you can do is you take a set of labeled data. Remember, if you're working with classification, it's a prediction problem. You must have labels for your training data. What you then do is for each one of the categories for the categorical feature, you then assign a certain number of Ks. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then you calculate the K-means clustering to get those prototype locations. Those are representative along that data set. Now what you do is you use the prototypes, the nearest prototype as a decision boundary for each one of the categories. Now, what's really cool, if, if for those of you who are familiar with prediction and machine learning, what's the hyperparameter here? The degree of complexity of the prediction model will be controlled by the... What would happen if you use a K equal to one? If you just have one centroid or one prototype for each data set, you would see that the decision boundary would simply be a line. If you use k equal to a large number, you could have a very complicated decision boundary. So your hyperparameter is simply k, low k, and Sandra, you nailed it, number of clusters. That's exactly it. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Now, why do we want to do anything more complicated? Because k means clustering was simple. Why don't we just stay there? That's a happy place. Uh, it has lots of limitations. Spherical, convex, isotropic clusters. That's what it's assuming. 
Okay, let me, I'll explain data convexity on the next slide because it's a little bit more complicated. Equal variance for all of the features, they have kind of the same ranges. Okay, the same size would be another way to see it. And the frequency within the clusters, about the same number of data per cluster. It also has a bunch of other things I won't mention, such as a no prior model or a naive prior model of, um, of uh, belonging to any one or association to any one of the clusters. You can't put in any type of prior model. There's a lot of other things. Thank you very much to this blog for this image right here. A great pathological case where k-means clustering does not succeed. Let me explain convexity because this is an important part or limitation of k-means clustering. The way to abstract or consider convexity, well, first of all, this would be considered a convex outline of the data. This would be a non-convex outline. So the definition of convexity within a geometry would be that for any two random points within the geometry, the line segment between the two points must be within that geometry, okay, or within that space. You can see in this example here, this is non-convexity. Now for your data, you don't have a data outline, but you could conceptually consider an outline of your data or each one of the clusters, and you could determine this. It would depend on the scale and so forth. But I think this is a helpful concept of the outlines of the groups. Now, so let's go ahead and take some data that's non, I, that is anisotropic. It's not same variance in all directions, same size, isotropic, non-convex. If you look very carefully, they have these curves that makes it non-convex. And some, something that really could be separated by density. You may not know you're doing it. But right now, because I use transparency on the points, you notice that there's a greater density along the core, lesser around the edges. Look at that one right there. You know that in between these two, that there is kind of a lower density. In your mind, you're thinking about density when it comes to group assignment. Let's use a methodology that's based on density. Let's do density-based clustering. The methodology we're gonna use is DB scan, density-based spatial clustering for applications with noise. Do you ever feel like people try too hard to get an acronym? Yeah, I do too sometimes. It's really, really powerful. It's a flexible methodology, it's quite intuitive, actually requires very little domain knowledge to estimate the parameters. You can, it might be a little tricky, but at the same time, they're very intuitive and I'll show you. It's hierarchical, bottom up, agglomerative clustering. So basically all the samples start as their own group and then you start to group them together. Um, we'll talk about exactly how we do that. Mutually exclusive. Do you remember what we said about k-means clustering? You can only belong to one group. Okay, we still do that, but it's no longer exhaustive, non-exhaustive. Some samples can be left, can be left unassigned or be deemed an outlier. Now that's pretty cool because now we're doing clustering and outlier detection in a high dimensionality, complicated multivariate space. Okay, so that's pretty powerful stuff. Let's go ahead, make a couple of comments about the parameters. Density based, the groups formed in feature space at locations with sufficient point density. So let's think about that. If I define something as point density, there's really two things I need, a numerator and a denominator. The first thing I need in the denominator is I need to know what's the area. What area am I dealing with? And a very convenient way to deal with area is a radius, a distance. So we're gonna have epsilon, it's gonna be our radius of the local neighborhood. Now we'll show you when it comes to coming up with this parameter, it really is um, based on the scale of the problem, a scale or resolution of the clusters. Too small, too many samples are left as outliers, too large, all the clusters merge into one big super cluster. <laughs> kind of fun to say. Now we also have another parameter and this is the numerator if you think about a point density calculation, that's the number of points. How many points do you actually need to have within that area before you consider it to be sufficiently dense in order to say that this is a cluster or group? Okay, so that's the whole idea of density-based clustering. How are we gonna solve it? Well, the first thing is epsilon is a little bit hard to calculate. You can do it visually, visual inspection, hard and high dimensional space, for sure. You can also use from point statistics, uh, spatial point statistics, there's a K distance graph. It's not a big deal. 
We calculate the k equals one distance graph, which is simply the distance from every point to its nearest neighbor. When you get those values, there's 1700 in our data set. You go ahead and sort them in ascending order, and then you plot it. And what you'll see is there's a lot of data very close to other data. And then there'll be some data which actually need quite a bit of distance to get to the nearest neighbor. This elbow right here is usually indicative of kind of a transition from the clusters to the intercluster spacing. Okay, and so people will use this elbow as a good first estimate. We'll use it too. Then you can also use it visually. Let's go ahead and show you DB scan by hand on PowerPoint, a PowerPoint animation. This took a little bit of time, but it was worth it. X2, X1, my two features. This is my data, all my samples. This is my minimum number of samples, four. This is my epsilon. I mean, that's my epsilon, that circle. That radius is my epsilon. Okay, all of my data are assigned unvisited. You remember how we said it's a glomerative? It means we're gonna start with all the data by themselves and they're gonna start grouping up over iterations. Okay, we're gonna randomly visit a location with that circle. We look around ourselves, do we have four data? If we have four data, then we can say we have a density-based cluster. Nope, we don't. So it gets determined to be an outlier. Then we go to another random location. One, two, three, four, five, Ooh, five and maybe six. I can't remember, but something like that data. This is now deemed to be a core point. It's dense enough. You remember we talked about number of points and the radius. It's considered to have enough density to be a cluster. We make it a core point. Because it's a core point, we now have to visit all of the other points within and we're trying to grow. Let's grow. We go here, we go here, we go here, we go here. This one fell outside when I did the calculation in PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, so these ones, when I check them, they all have at least four samples in their radius, their core points. This does not, it's a boundary point to that core point. Then what we do is now we have new core points. We got to repeat. This is a recursive algorithm. Now we're going to have to go ahead and do recursion. We check those points. When we check all of those points, we expand to here. We then check those points and they remain as core points. And we keep growing, growing, growing until everything starts to become boundary points because we don't have enough samples around them. So now we have these core points, these boundary points, and we're stuck. What do we do now? Go to another random location, repeat. This is the approach for DB scan. And we got an outlier. We go over here, one, two, three, four. We got another core point. Now we check all of the points in the neighborhood. We see if their core points are gonna be boundary, 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 and core. This has enough points. Now we have to check around it. We found this point, it's core. We check around it, boundary, boundary. So we grew, we grew, we grew until we can't grow anymore. Now we're blocked off by these boundary points and we've got, that's it. Now we're gonna to go to another random location. Nope, 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 and we finish up. So we basically, we have finished up now with all of our labeling as far as core and boundary points and outlier. Now, this is pretty cool. Now, you might look at this and say, okay, well, Michael, I thought you said you were going to actually do clustering. All you've done is made core points, boundary points, and outliers, and nothing is unvisited now. Well, you're right. we got to do something. Let's make three definitions to get to the actual clustering approach. First, directly densible reach, directly density reachable, sorry, is simply means that a sample that is within the radius of a core point is directly density reachable by that core point. Okay, so far so good. The next definition is density reachable. We're gonna relax it a little bit. Density reachable means that I am in, I'm a point that is directly density reachable by a core point and that core point is reachable by a chain of other core points to get back to that core point. In other words, this and this, these two points are density reachable. You see what we're doing? We're going on a chain. Now we're gonna take one more step. We're gonna say density connected, we'll loosen it up a little bit. We'll say that it's okay if we can reach a common boundary point between the two, we're gonna connect that. Okay, so we'll put those two strings together because they could both reach the same boundary point. Now we have density connected. 
Okay, so all of these are density connected with each other. Now, what do we do? We're gonna assign the clusters based on being density connected. So this right here, all density connected cluster two. All of these white points, density connected, they'll be cluster one. This is the approach of dbSCAN. Now, oh, so are there any general questions right now or questions about this? Yeah, and, and so Victor, you've asked a very, very good question. What is the consequence of not considering spatial continuity? And I love this. This is actually, I have 12 PhD students. This is a topic we often face and we're dealing with right now in our research. And I would agree, everything we've done here today has been multivariate. We've just said, okay, let's go ahead and look with feature one, feature two, feature one, we'll try to figure out their clusters. I would agree that we should be considering the spatial arrangement. Let me just put it this way. The first line of defense for those of you in geomodeling is a decision of stationarity, grouping, or bases. So if you know that there is already a break in this data set due to different depositional setting or bases and so forth, go ahead and put that in. Now do all of your work hierarchically within those spaces. That's a, we already know in the subsurface geostatistics world, modeling world, that 80%, often 80%, 90% of the heterogeneity is captured in facies or the segmentation. If there's trends too, we should account for that. Aside from that, there are other methods um, to try to incorporate spatial information here, but I really wouldn't have time to kind of get into that. It's more research. Yeah, thank you. Let's go ahead and let's do a little bit of DB scan. I'll show you how to do it. The good thing about it too is that it'll get us using scikit-learn. What I was doing before was simply just using the um, by hand, the functions from the Ben Keen from the blog, which is super cool. Thank you again. What we'll do is I have a little bit of explanation about density-based clustering. We'll go ahead and import some packages. I have my spatial data analytics package for some of the plotting. I don't do any real geostats here. Kind of what Victor was talking about in geostats, spatial arrangements, but we won't do that here. We'll go ahead and we'll work with dbscan. It is part of the scikit-learn package in Python, the cluster module. And I'll tell you what, in cluster module, there are tons of different clustering methodologies and great documentation. Um, check it out, look at it. We'll go ahead and load up a data set. Now I made a brand new data set just yesterday to show you guys that I thought was kind of cool. You'll notice it performs quite well. It's, it's not a hard problem. But what I also did, and I do this when we have time in the class, you could toggle this to true, and then I would cut you loose and tell you, go ahead and spend 10 minutes trying to figure this out on your own. That can be a lot of fun, a really good challenge for sure. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead, we'll load the data set up, we'll visualize the table of the data, just the first five samples to make sure we got facies, acoustic impedance, and porosity. We're not going to use the facies, but we have them there to check because we're doing clustering. We don't have labels but I have them here on this data set, but we're just being able to check back against them. Let's go ahead and we we'll look at the proportions. What you'll see immediately is that the facies proportions are normally facies one, then two, then three. This would be a problem for k-means clustering. And I'll show you, it doesn't work very well. Okay, let's go ahead. We're gonna transform the data. I'm using the proper scikit-learn methodologies now. We're doing the transform, which is part of scikit-learn. Um, a functionality there where we can get all of our data standard normal. And so when we look at it, we're going to have all of our data right here. Um, I believe this is actually min-max normalized. Okay, so we'll go, we'll see right away. Normalized the min of zero, max of one, min-max normalized. Okay, now we'll go ahead and we'll look at the data. Trans, this is the original data right here, acoustic impedance, the correct units this time porosity. And if you look here, it's not a hard problem. We got a little weirdness here in the data. That's for sure. We got a bit of a truncation effect. Otherwise, it looks pretty good. Maybe there's something anomalous going on here. It's not perfect data, um, but it's not too difficult of a problem. I have a much more difficult data set to try to do DB scan on, but this is a good place to start. We'll go ahead and we'll just set a random seed number because there are going to be random approaches here. And it is a random iterative methodology. We want to get the same answer for everybody if we were running this together. And we can go ahead and look at the original data. Here's the original porosity versus acoustic impedance and normalized space right here. We'll do everything in normalized space. That problem of distances, 
be having to have them similar in all directions. The same problem with DD scan because we're using distance calculations again. Now let's go ahead and run k-means clustering. I prove it to you. k-means clustering one line of code, random number seed right here. We can go ahead and just fit and run in one line of code, and that's what we get. Look at what went wrong. You see what happened here? We break up these density clusters right here because of the assumption of uniform probability, equal size, convexity. The algorithm just fails to do a good job with this data set. K-means clustering would not do very well with this complicated data. Okay, let's go ahead. We'll go back and just take a look. This is what would happen if we work with the original units. It looks absolutely awful. You can see that we have to use the normalization. It almost collapses to a line. Okay, so I hope everyone's convinced. Let's go ahead and get started with K -mean, with using DB scan. This is the example of what would happen though if we did K means clustering and we did not use normalization. You see what's happening here? Is this distance right here appears really big. This distance appears very small like shown in this figure. And so the result is the clusters are really only on one axis. You see like a line. That would be really bad for clustering. Okay, DB scan. Let's get into DB scan clustering. We'll go ahead and we'll take a look at the data and we'll apply an initial attempt at DB scan. If you look right here, we've gone ahead and just fit using an epsilon of 0 0.025, kind of a first guess, minimum number samples of 10. Now we could go ahead and try to fit or find the very best hyperparameters for this density-based clustering right here. Let's go ahead. Um, well, first, let me just make a couple observations. First of all, you notice how we've got one cluster here, one cluster here. We've got a bunch of outliers. This is not optimum. This was a first guess. One cluster here, one cluster here, bunch of outliers. All the X's are outliers. That's not super good. Um, but you do see from the histogram of the groups that it does handle the idea of different size groups quite well. Okay, let's go ahead. What I'll do here is we'll set a bunch of epsilons in a list um, three minimum number of samples. That once again is the numerator in the calculation and for density. And we'll go ahead and take a look right here. This is our three by three matrix epsilon going from 0 0.01, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1. The uh, minimum number of samples going from 5, 20 to 50. So you see we've got the combinatorial of three different settings of each. And look at this. You see this one right here? Very nice. You see how we're picking up on cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. We've got outliers. We've got excellent separation. I wouldn't argue too much about these outliers. In fact, what's interesting, if we do try to capture those outliers by increasing the epsilon or by increasing the minimum number of samples, you see what happens? We start to span clusters. That's what will happen. We'll start to group too much together. Okay, so that's really important too. Let me go ahead and I'm going to just show you how we could go ahead, uh, objectively try to calculate the epsilon value using this idea of a K equals one nearest neighbor plot right here, which is sorted and you can see the elbow right here. And we can read from it a pretty good guess of the first epsilon value. All right. We'll go ahead, we can try to tune it based on our best results. We can show the results right here in original space, in transform normalized space. And we can see the histograms for each one of the groups. And we're able to honor the fact that you have uh, some significant differences in the number of data in each one of the groups and still performs quite well. All right, that is density-based clustering. Now, I wanna ask just as we finish up here, I have been watching the chat window I did see a couple of questions about access. And I did see a couple of- Michael, can I just quickly address this? I know we've been getting okay. quite a bit. I just um, wanted to quickly jump well, in. Well, I asked a question. I have a question regarding finding the optimum number of clusters present in data set using silhouette score. What does it mean if you have a silhouette score of less than five? How do we find the optimal number of metrics when silhouette score and elbow plot are not consistent? Okay. Eliza, I'm, I must apologize. That's like, that's kind of a lot of details right now for me to get into. I would like to, I should, you know, if you want, I can, you can talk to me offline. I'll go ahead and provide a little bit of details that can help you on that. But there's a bunch that can be said for sure about that. I do appreciate the question. Let me go ahead and ask a couple of questions at the end. Let's see how we're doing for retention of knowledge. 
Okay. Cl uh, clustering. For k-means clustering, what is the loss function? Okay, we talked about the loss function for k-means clustering. Is it minimizing the number of k clusters? Is it removing all the outliers? Is it minimizing the difference between the data in each cluster? Or is it maximizing differences between the data in each cluster? All right, I've got 20 responses. I'll close the poll in three, two, one, and I'll share the results. Good job, guys, you nailed it. Yes, the inertia statistic was metric was literally a measure or summarization of the dis difference or distance, Euclidean distance between samples within a cluster. Okay, let me just try one more question. Let me see, I'll try to find a hard one here. Oh, okay. What are or is the hyperparameter or parameters for a DB scan? The number of clusters, the number of features, the K distance graph, the radius and the minimum number of points. I've got 13 solutions or 13 answers, 18. I'll close it up in three, two, one. Oh, you guys did great. Let me share this with you. Okay, you know it, you know it. The radius and the minimum number of points. And it's quite intuitive because remember, if you're thinking about a density-based clustering method, when you have sufficient density, it really is a calculation of number of points per area. So it makes sense that number of points, minimum number of points over the radius. So that, that makes a lot of sense as far as getting the a density measure. Okay. That's two o'clock for me. I do need to run to another appointment. I usually try to have some minutes to hang out and talk to people after these. I do apologize today, but um, thank you very much everyone for attending. Um, please, the question, there was one question I did not answer. I apologize, I just didn't have time to cover that. I noticed I was running short. Send me an email. I'll be happy to send you a couple of resources and comments on what to do when they're inconsistent. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. All right, thank you, Laura. Thank you for mentioning it was useful. I hope it was. And Thanks, Thomas, Michael. thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, Don, nice seeing you. Thank you for participating, Eric. Okay, awesome, Avi. I'm going to have to bail here right now. Sounds good, Michael. We'll see you. We'll see you soon.